Welcome back to the Chasing Cashflow podcast. You are listening to episode number 12. And at the time, she was like $5,000. Like to some people, that may seem like a lot, but I paid way more than that for my college degree. And if $5,000 means that I get to take the elevator instead of the stairs, then I'm going to do that. Welcome back to the Chasing Cashflow Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And if this is your first time listening to this podcast, this podcast is all about interviewing successful real estate investors and entrepreneurs as they share how they started their business and scaled. Whether you have no properties or 100 properties, listeners can expect to learn actionable steps to grow and sustain their own real estate portfolio. If you haven't already, please make sure to leave a review on this podcast on whatever app you are listening to. It will help tremendously for the Chasing Cashflow podcast. Also, if you haven't followed us on Instagram or YouTube, please make sure to do that at Chasing Cashflow podcast where you'll get content all about real estate investing. Now, I am super excited for today's guest. So on the podcast, we've had some amazing people, but we haven't had someone on that focuses primarily on shorter term rentals. And what I mean by that is today's guest focuses on midterm and short term investing, which is like Airbnbs, VRBOs, and then midterm to like uh, traveling nurses. So I I think there's going to be a lot of content and Honestly, she goes into depth of how to maximize your cash flow for the shorter term rentals and how they cash flow a little bit longer than the long term. I think it's a great strategy and I think she has a ton of knowledge. She's able to travel the world right now. She gives an example uh, in the podcast today that she was out of the country and she was negotiating a deal. So it's just, you know, the power of real estate and, and what you can accomplish even out of state and out of the country for this matter, is unbelievable as long as you have the right systems in. So super excited to get into today's podcast. Tune in and I hope you guys enjoy. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Chasing Cashflow podcast. Today we have a great guest in Sarah Weaver. How you doing today, Sarah? I'm great, Evan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, I know you travel all over the place. Where are you joining us from today? Yeah, I drove into Kansas City late last night, and I'm only here for two days, but it feels good to be at my parents' house. Oh, great. <laughs> well, we're going to dive into how you're able to travel a lot. But uh, first off, we kind of just want to know, how did you get started in real estate at first, and uh, you know why real estate? Absolutely. I bought my first property in 2017, and you guys, I really, all I knew back then was this is what my lender said my mortgage insurance taxes would be. And this is what I think I can rent it out for. And so I, you know, subtracted one from the, the other and I thought, woohoo, I'm rich. And <laughs> now I'm a little more savvy and I calculate for things like vacancy, capex, repairs, property management fees, all of these things that back then I didn't know. And I still dove in and took action. Yeah, I think I think the best part of that that right now is just taking action because until you jump into a deal, you're not going to learn anything. And a lot of the first deal, it, we touch on this a lot on this podcast. The first deal isn't about the money; it's about learning and uh, you know making mistakes and pretty much onto the next deal so that you don't make those mistakes again. Um, so, how how did you even get in, introduced to real estate in the first place? Yeah, I actually goes way, way back. I was a receptionist at a Keller Williams office as my high school job. And I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but when they hired me, they were like, maybe you don't mention that you're in high school. Like we're not asking you to lie, (laughs) but maybe our clients won't really love that you're a high school student, but lucky for them, I've been 30 since I was like 12 years old. And so (laughs) nobody even asked how old I was. (laughs) Oh, great. And just being around real estate and the realtors and everything, you kind of got the bug and uh, decided to jump full, full fledged into real estate. Well, no, it's always been this like slow trickle. Like, so I had that as my like job when I was 15, 16 years old. Um, didn't really think anything of it, you know, as a normal 15, 16 year old worried about other things like sports and boys and getting into college. (laughs) And then, um, I went to university and I got a journalism degree So I went into journalism and realized, wow, you make no money. (laughs) And so then I actually taught English in South Korea 
because I wanted to live abroad, but I had student loans and student loan payments that were coming up. So I couldn't just backpack Europe like some of my peers. I needed to make money. And so thankfully, I found out that you could get paid a lot of money to teach English abroad. So I taught English in Daegu, South Korea. And I am a saver, Evan. Like that is one thing that I think I have to mention that I naturally am a really good saver. I don't like to spend money. I'm constantly working and wheeling and dealing. And even from a young age, I would like buy things and turn around and sell them. So I've always been saving money. And during that year in South Korea, I saved enough money to pay off my student loans. Wow. Congratulations. That's that's awesome. Uh, especially so how's the what's the difference? Like, is it a lot cheaper over there? Not necessarily. Like things are still dollar for dollar as yeah. as like as they cost. Um, but you can live cheaply. And so yeah. for me, my apartment was paid for by the school, the flight over there was paid by the school. I would go to 7-Eleven and get some beers and put those in my purse before going out. And so I was a frugal, frugal girl from a very young age. Um, and so it was able to save money that way. Wow, that's awesome. So when did you dive in and get your first deal? Was that before or after you went to South Korea? Yeah. So after Korea, I moved to Texas and really had like the first time after university where I thought, what do I want to do? Like, what do I want to do with my life? And two things were really true. I wanted to be in control of my own time and my own schedule. Um, I didn't quite have the foresight at the moment to realize that I also wanted to work remotely, which is came really soon after. But in order to control my own time and my own schedule, I thought, wow, let's become a real estate agent. You're your own there boss you is what I thought. But really, <laughs> you're actually you have 19 bosses because every client you have is your boss. If Evan, yeah. you you and your partner want to go see a house after work, then I need to drop what I'm doing and show you a house at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday. And so really quickly, I realized, OK, that isn't it either. OK, so journalism wasn't it. Teaching English wasn't it. So now being a realtor wasn't it. What is it? And I think the one gift that I have that's become even more clear, like in my late 20s, but even in my early 20s, I realized I'm really good at connecting with people. And so yeah. I I really asked my my mentors and, and my peers, what should I do? And they're like, Sarah, you'd be so good at recruiting. Oh, and wow. so I found a job where I was recruiting um, administrative staff within the real estate industry. And Evan, the best part is that I could work remotely. <laughs> there you go. And that's, uh, that's the best of both worlds right there. And I, yeah. I, I really want to touch on as well. So you said that, you know, you're a real estate agent and, uh, I love that you touched on that and saying, you know, you do get to make your own schedule, but I'm a real estate agent as well. But like you said, you have to drop everything for your clients and then without a structure or without, you know, setting yourself up for a structure in working, if you don't sell homes, you don't make money. So that's another thing as well, which I, I think I definitely want to touch on later as well. How, you know, how you being out of state and everything, how you connect with realtors and make sure that they know you're not wasting their time, which I think is huge. And it's hard to separate um, which one, especially when you're first starting off. But um, but yeah, let, uh, let's continue into that first deal. Where how did you kind of get into that? Yeah, absolutely. So at the time I was working as a recruiter in the real estate industry. So I knew a lot of real estate agents. Um, however, what I what I realized is that not very many real estate agents actually invest in real estate. So when I met one, she really stood out. And I think she had four or five homes. Typically her and her husband at the time would move into the house, fix it, and then move out and either do the live and flip and sell it and use the proceeds for the next one or they would move out and they'd turn it into a rental. And so I saw how she was doing this. And because of my knowledge of financing, I thought, wow, okay, you're telling me that I could move into a house, pay three, three and a half or 5% down, which at 27, I had that type of money. Um, and then I could just do it again and again and again. That's when a light bulb went off. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, so was was this first deal, was that a single family, multifamily? I bought a single family in Prairie Village, Kansas. You can't make those kind of names up. It really is called <laughs> Prairie Village. And it's a single family. It was a three bedroom, one and a half bath. 
And when I saw the half bath, it backed up to a closet. And because of my, my dad is in construction. And so my limited construction knowledge told me, cool, I can bust out into that closet. That could be the shower. And I could turn this into a three, two, but but little did I know, I also, the attic space could be the fourth bedroom. So I ended up taking the entire upstairs of the house down to the studs, building out over the garage and making it a four, two. Wow. Okay. And, uh, well, first off, would you say that, you know, get when someone just starting getting into real estate, would you suggest them going with a agent, like you said, that has real estate investing, um, experience? I think it really helps. However, yeah. in this age where, or this market, I should say, it's really hard to find deals. And so if an agent that doesn't have investing experience somehow sends you an amazing deal, <laughs> like please buy the deal and then <laughs> and then find a mentor or a mastermind or someone that you can reach out to. And so I do investor con- consulting and during one of my consultations, it was really clear that the investor was working with an agent that had no idea what they were doing in terms of investing, but they were a good agent. They're good at it. And they, they had an inspector and appraiser. They had all these pieces to get them from contract to close, but after close, they probably weren't going to be the best resource for them. And so thankfully they signed up for coaching with me. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So, okay. So you, you turn this into a four, two, obviously you, did you live in it at all or did you just rent it out to begin with? I did. So I lived in it. Um, I didn't want to, I should say. I was living in Denver at the time and I moved to Kansas City with tears in my eyes because I saw that. No offense to Kansas City, but that isn't where I wanted to live. Um, But I had bigger plans. And so I knew that just a year of delayed gratification could be the foundation of a really strong rental portfolio. And so I made the drive to Kansas City and I moved into that house. And then because I was still working remotely, I spent about half of that year traveling. Wow. So no, really I, I, I definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's absolutely amazing. But I love, I absolutely love the quote. It's one of my favorites. Do what others won't now so you can live how others can't later. It's, uh, you know, you have to sacrifice. And obviously you, you it would have been much easier and you probably would have been happier, obviously, uh, maybe staying in Denver. But you did what you had to do in order to get into the deal and, uh, you know, do what you had to so that you can run it out. But it, it sounds like you traveled, so it still kind of was the best of both worlds. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, so, um, so you rented that out, obviously. So, what about fast forward to today? What kind of you know what's your business look like, and what all do you have going on right now? Yeah, it, I'm, I love this question because I found out last year. So I started three businesses in 2021. And I went to a conference and a man on stage stood up and said, you did not start a business. You started a job if, and then he named some things and I'm sitting in the audience like, oh crap, I started three (laughs) jobs. (laughs) And so, so I have been working really hard to systematize and actually make these jobs a business. And so the, the three businesses that I have, um, aside from investing in real estate, um, I now own 15 units in four different states. It's six different properties. And so I'm, so I'm an investor. I coach real estate agents. So that job where I was recruiting staff for agents quickly turned into consulting for agents and then actually traveling the U.S. and Canada speaking in real estate brokerages. So by 2000, by 2019, I was traveling and speaking in real estate brokerages. And there, that's when a light bulb went off that like, I love real estate agents. They, they do a lot for their clients, but they often aren't looking out for themselves So one of my missions is to help real estate agents invest in real estate. And so I now have a coaching business where I coach real estate agents, not only to work with investors, if it makes sense in their market, but more importantly, how to build wealth through real estate investing. Wow. I think that's awesome. I I think that's, uh, I mean, I I haven't heard anyone that actually goes, goes around, speaks at brokerages and, you know, kind of, is that the purpose is to not convince, but to teach them that, look, there's another way to build wealth while you're in real estate. 
Yeah, absolutely. So just next month, I'm flying to San Francisco and I'll be teaching at six different real estate brokerages and I'll be teaching them how to invest out of state because they're in the Bay Area and it's a little hard to make properties cash flow out there. So I'll be teaching them how to invest. And then one of the real estate teams is actually also having me come in and give a presentation to their clients about out-of-state investing. So it's like a client appreciation event for them. So their clients are going to love them forever for bringing me in to teach them how to invest. And then Evan, when the real estate agent refers them to an agent in Iowa or Idaho, they'll get a referral or a piece of that commission when they refer them. Wow. Okay. So yeah. It, and the, the thing that I love about this is that all three of your businesses tie together. Yeah. It's not like you got one that's like far out there. That's a completely different, you know, a section. No, all three of them tied together. And, um, yeah, that's absolutely amazing. I love the the model that you have going on here. First, let's Thank go you. to let's let's touch on your investing first. So, do you manage all of them yourself? Yes, and I need to stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have a virtual assistant who is okay. kind of the in between between me and any new tenants. However, the tenants previous to the virtual assistant, they're still messaging me, texting me if there's problems, and so I am self managing all 15 units, sometimes from thousands of miles away. And five of my 15 units are furnished rentals. In the summer, they're running as Airbnb. And in the winter, they're running as what I call medium term for traveling nurses. Wow. Okay. So first off, like just a typical week, how much is allocated just for, you know, managing? And then also, can you kind of go in and touch on as well? How do you build systems so that you can manage out of state, because obviously that's going to be more difficult than if it's down the road. Absolutely. And even if anyone listening buys a property down the road, you you should treat it like a business, just like I got called out from on stage. Like real estate investing should be a business and not a job. And you're likely not buying a property to get a phone call to go check out a furnish or a leaky dishwasher or whatever it is, which by the way, those calls never do happen at four in the morning. (laughs) Like non real estate investors will tell you like they just never do. Um, so, so some of the things that I would recommend is you should have a spreadsheet. I always have it as a Google doc or a Google sheet so that it's available on my phone because you're never going to be near your computer when things happen. And in that Google sheet, I recommend having every repairman that you can think of. So you need multiple plumbers, electricians, appliance handyman. Turns out your plumber likely tells you, oh, I don't do dishwashers. So you also need to have appliance handyman. Um, You need to have a window guy. Um, I just had a broken window last week and my handyman says, I don't do windows. So now I need to have window people. And that sheet will just grow over time. And so what I want to make sure people understand is, I didn't have all of this before I invested in real estate. You you typically have 30 to 45 days before you close. You can really figure all of this out on the go. And even like me, I had a window situation last week and I realized I didn't have a window guy. Well, now I have three window guys that I added to the list last Friday. That I, I love the I love the Google Sheet adding them so that you know when something does come up you don't have to stress trying to find one you have a list right there. How do you find them? Do you have do you get recommendations? Do you give them like a tiny project at first see how they do? Often I am relying on other investors in the market. I have a really large network of real estate investors, and I truly believe in abundance mindset. So if someone texts me and says, "Hey, I need a plumber." I'm going to send them my plumber because who knows, maybe the next day or a year later, I'm going to need a roofer. And so I really believe like sharing truly is caring. And so I have a huge network of investors. And if you don't, if you're like, okay, that sounds great, Sarah, but I don't know anyone, then get on the internet and join Facebook groups, like join Omaha Investing Real Estate or Annapolis Investors. There's all of these Facebook groups and inside those Facebook groups, they're all searchable. So you can actually click the search button and then type in the word plumber and you'll see that some other investor asked about a plumber five months ago 
and there's nine comments on that Facebook post and you can pull those plumbers from there. Yeah, I always stress, um, I, I probably say too much on this, but your net worth is your network. So I, I hugely agree with that. Just for the sole fact of, you know, you never know who can help you. And by gaining, you know, the trust of local real estate investors, I feel like they're more willing willing to share and, you know, how successful you are. They're probably willing, willing to go above and beyond to recommend someone that is their personal, you know, contractor. And, and a lot of people don't know this right now, but it's hard to find good contractors right now. <laughs> and, just, you know, just in t- typical. So when you get one good one, you kind of try to hold on to it. Um, so as far as reaching out, so you got, you know, a list of repairs, uh, repair men, women. What else do you have to have in order to invest out of state? Yeah. I mean, even if you're investing in state, you need to have a great way for your tenants to pay rent. So okay. I recommend a veil or apartments.com. They both essentially do the same thing. And you need to make it as simple as possible. Your tenant will electronically sign a lease. You need to save that lease somewhere safe so that you can refer back to it. You should take their security deposit and their rent automatically all online. Everything should be online. Um, They also can submit maintenance requests through either of those programs. And everything should be documented just to cover yourself and cover them as well. Um, The other thing that you want is you want to have a great attorney or property manager on call. So I have both of those things so that when something happens, which it's not a matter of if it will happen, it's a matter of when as you start to scale. And you you just need to have people in your corner that you can call and ask questions to because I like a lot of your listeners, I mean, I'm running other businesses in addition to investing in real estate. And so I don't have time to research security deposit laws in Nebraska. I need a quick answer. And so sometimes I pay a property manager a consulting fee to get those answers. Uh, love it. Love it. Um, so how, how does it, you know, how is it different from managing a short-term rental and managing uh, you know, a longer term rental. And then I also want to touch on your midterm as well. Is there any different between midterm and short term? Yeah, there is. So so long term is for if you're going to have a property manager, it's it's pretty much sit it and forget it. Your property manager is the one that's going to be getting maintenance requests. They're gonna handle evictions when those happen. I'm in the middle of eviction right now. <laughs> and your the property manager is gonna handle all of that. So if you're looking to be passive, do a long-term buy and hold and hire a property manager. If you're wanting to create more cash flow from your property, depending on where it's located, I recommend short-term and medium-term. So short-term is Airbnb, VRBO, what people think of when they think of short-term rental. Medium-term is 30 days or more. So I'm often having tenants, or in this case, I almost call them guests, that stay 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days or more. And they are wanting a furnished apartment that's really cute, has a great bed, and is very easy to maintain. So it needs to be fixed up. It doesn't have to be perfect, but all of these amenities should be there. So I even provide my realist, my traveling nurses with what I call a starter kit. So they're going to have a few rolls of toilet paper, a few rolls of paper towels, um, a little those little pods for the dishwasher, maybe even a laundry pod or two just so that when they land, they have everything that they need. But I'm not providing toilet paper, coffee, paper towels, and laundry the entire stay. So that's one difference. The other is that I'm only cleaning the property when they move in and when they move out. And so there's less communication between me and my cleaner, and there's less cleaning fees. And then also there's only a turnover every three months. And about 40% of my traveling nurses have extended their stay from three months to six months because they've extended their hospital contract. Okay. So is that who usually you target to is uh, traveling nurses? It is. Yep. I use a website called furnishfinder.com and it's mostly, it's not a traveling nurse website, but that is where all the traveling nurses hang out. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, obviously 
you're able to charge a premium because of that, correct? Because of everything, um, you know, all the furnishing and them being only having to stay for 30 to 90 days, maybe a little bit longer um, instead of signing a year lease, correct? Yes. And you're paying utilities. So that's one thing that okay. some new investors forget to calculate is you're going to be taking care of all of the utilities during that time. So the margin needs to be big enough. So for example, I have a four unit, a four, a fourplex or a quad. They're all one bedroom, one bath units. Two of the units are currently long-term tenants. They pay eight, one pays 830, one pays 850. And then my other two units are furnished. And during the month of August, I had them on Airbnb and they both brought in about 2,200. <laughs> wow. Oh my yes. God. That, that is a great way to, you know, go ahead. It is really good. However, let's, let's break down the math. So I paid for utilities. So let's say that was, I think my average was 489 for both units. Okay, so that's like what we let's do two forty off of twelve hundred. Is that with then like TV? I, had, I don't provide cable, but I just have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime with a um, an Amazon Fire Stick or a Roku. Yeah, great question though. Um, I do provide Wi Fi. It has to be very high speed Wi Fi. Like they are going to ask, and Airbnb <laughs> actually added a new feature where you can say your Wi Fi speed. And as someone that's constantly on video, I need strong Wi Fi, so that was understandable. Yeah. So you have, um, you're going to have to take away utilities. In August, you don't have to worry about snow removal, but you do need to worry about mowing the lawn. That happens either way if you're doing long-term or short-term. But then the other thing is cleaning fees. So in the month of August, I allowed a lot of one and two night stays because I was of the mentality, let's just get as many nights as we can. And, and that resulted in a lot of cleaning fees. And so, which is great because I love my cleaner and I want to give her the business but when I sat down and did the math, it was like, wow, okay, for that market, because I can't charge $200 a night in Omaha, Nebraska on an Airbnb, I'm charging $89 a night most of the time. So for me, it actually made, switch, made sense to switch over in September and August as Airbnb occupancy went down because less people are hanging out in Omaha in September. I decided to switch to traveling nurses. And so the numbers on this are really cool. So I, I provide the, the same amenities. I'm just not restocking K-cups and toilet paper all the time. But I provide the same amenities and I'm charging $15.75. And if they have a pet, there's a $200 refundable deposit. That's refundable. But I also charge a $175 pet fee, which is non-refundable. In addition to that, I also charge a $150 cleaning fee at the end of their lease. And then my cleaner doesn't charge me $150. Unless it's really messy, then sometimes I have yeah. spent almost that. Otherwise, she charges me about $75. So after all of that, there's no, there's no fees during the three months that they're staying because I'm not getting it cleaned every two to three days. And I am still paying about the same in utilities. A traveling nurse has not used more utilities than an Airbnb guest, according to my data. Yeah. Wow. That's that's so interesting that you say that too, because it's like a what I've found is it's a complete 50-50 on if they allow pets or not. Some people have had some, you know, some terrible experiences and just say no. And then some people are looking to, you know, cap out as much as they can, you know, rent a property out for, which I think pets are 100%, you know, a great way to do that. Because if you put something, you know, I would love to hear your um, experience as well. But if, if you put on, you know, a listing saying no pets, then you cut down probably 70% of the people looking. Do you find that too? Yeah, about 80% of my medium term rental guests have a pet. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me. I mean, I'm a pet lover. I don't want your listeners to be like, oh my gosh, Sarah hates pets. Um, Cause I am a pet lover, but you know, what I don't love, I don't really love dog hair on the brand new couch that I just bought to put in the midterm rental. And that's where mindset comes into play. I thought, okay, what is worst case scenario? A dog, actually a dog did vomit on a rug and I don't know why, but the traveling nurse didn't say anything or maybe she didn't notice. So I, I used her one, her pet fee, and then her pet deposit to clean the rug. And it was no no harm, no foul. 
And so I thought, okay, that actually wasn't that bad. And you're running a business. So that's not my rug. Yes, I bought it or my business bought it, but that's not my rug. Just like it's not my couch. This is all a business. I, I love that. And you, I mean, that's a precaution right there. That non-refundable, the pet fee and the refundable are all precautions for if something like that does happen. So you're, you already set it up. So, you know, even if the worst does happen, I'll be protected, which I absolutely, absolutely love. Um, as far as, you know, finding rents, is there anywhere, you know, for someone that's just getting started, maybe he's interested, uh, has a lot of hospitals or anything around interested in finding out maybe what they can rent a midterm rental yeah. for. Is there a place you can find that? Yeah, it's funny. I noticed this, this was a need. And so I actually started another company, um, called Aria <laughs> design and we will analyze your market or your property for you. We'll tell you what is long-term rent, medium-term rent, and short-term rent, average daily stay, occupancy, vacancy, and then we'll advise you on what strategy we think is best. And then from there, we can sell you our furniture list. Like, And it has everything. It's not just like buy a couch and wow. buy spoons. We actually show you like what spoons, bed sheets, artwork we recommend. Wow, we, that's we sell incredible. That. Thank you. And then you also, Evan, you could fly us out, fly us out during that weekend we were talking about with the Blue Angels <laughs> yeah. and we'll furnish your unit for you. So you can fly my team out. We'll furnish it from beginning to end, or we can do everything remotely. And this is usually where I lose people. People are like, wait, what? But yeah, <laughs> I just furnished a unit in Detroit, Michigan. It's actually our fourth unit for that client from Guatemala. So I'm in Guatemala he sent me photos, videos, and measurements of the unit, and we shopped and decorated the unit from Guatemala. He or his handyman and property manager are the ones that put the things in the unit. And we even showed him like this piece of art goes on this wall and these throw pillows go on the bed in that room. Like it's all a mood board. We show you everything. Wow. That's just another business that adds to, you know, the same realm of real estate. So is that, you know, those are the two options you fly you out, you you would shop locally or would it all be sent yep. there and then you design it? Or, a little bit of both, but we try to curate more locally if you're going to fly us in. Gotcha. Okay. And then, or you can have it so that you guys pick out everything, everything down to like the details and then, yep. you know, just get sent there and you get a list saying where it all goes. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow, and then that, everything that's, that's else. Incredible. Like, thanks, Evan. Thank you. And it's fun. Like we've done, I think we've done 17 units in nine states. Okay. So far. Um, and I just yeah. launched the company like big like end of last year. And so it's been really, really fun. And then that deal analysis that I mentioned at the beginning, that's our most popular product. I, okay. I, I have, I have requests for that every week. So people are thinking about turning, like maybe they heard on a podcast, oh, Traveling nurses, that sounds really lucrative. I wonder if my long-term unit that I currently own could be switched over to that. And so that's a lot of our clients. They're using us to analyze their properties that they may already own. Maybe their tenant is moving out in May and they're thinking, huh, instead of renting it out again as long-term, should I go ahead and furnish it? Do the numbers make sense? Yeah, I see a lot of investors now, um, especially since the market's unbelievable. They try to look to other options to, you know, f make a deal work. And you know, with you having the experience of short term, mid term, and long term, being able to provide that, provide you know the value of what all you can rent it for, what's probably going to be most profitable, and being able to come out and actually show someone like myself, if I were to buy a short term rental, I don't know how to furnish it, <laughs> you know. So uh, it, that's where you come into play and know exactly what works. And uh, I think that's I think that's a great business. Um, I Thank feel like you. you're gonna I feel like you're gonna bring out like seven more businesses by the time we're done. <laughs> you just oh yeah, I started that too. <laughs> I have no. I do have one more, but that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay, okay. Would you like to say what that is? Yeah, so I host retreats for real estate investors and agents, and we meet in locations typically where it makes sense to invest, but sometimes it's just going to be a location that I want to go to. So I haven't okay. announced it yet, but I'm pretty sure my next retreat will be abroad. Oh, um, wow. I'm going to announce it in the next month. And during these retreats, I bring together no more than 15 investors or entrepreneurs 
And we really deep dive not only into your business, but also into your personal goals. I think goal setting is so important. And a lot of people do it once a year and they sit it and forget it. And then they attend a bunch of conferences, which I'm guilty of. I love going to conferences. But the problem with conferences is that you leave so motivated, but then you have 10 more business ideas. Maybe that's my problem. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And you don't have a strategy. And so, okay, it's great that I'm telling you about traveling nurses, but I don't want you to say that you're interested in that and you're also interested in mobile home parks and you're also interested in buying a short-term rental in the Smokies. And then I call you three months down the road and Evan, you haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. And so the idea behind the retreats are, these are for very serious action takers. So even if you've been on the sidelines, like consuming a lot of books and podcasts and you're just like, okay, okay, I know I need to stop learning. I need to start taking action. Those are the types of entrepreneurs that we want to help and they come to the retreat. And I'm really excited to say that five of the 15 that attended last month, I think it was five weeks ago, five of the 15 are under contract. Wow. Okay. So do you kind of advertise this to maybe, uh, you know, newer investors or investors that already have taken action? You know, it's hard. I I've been asked like, do you, do I need to own rentals? Is there a unit count? I'm the type of investor. I want us to stop talking about how many units we own. I don't think that that's an indicator of our success, our ability, our desire to take action. I, I think instead I want to attract action takers. So if you don't think that you could buy something in the next 90 days, maybe it's not the right retreat for you. But if yeah. you you want to buy in the next 90 days, but there's some piece missing, maybe it's confidence in your ability to analyze a deal. Maybe it's not being able to figure out creative financing or you're too scattered like I was and you were looking at too many markets. If there's just one piece that needs to be tweaked, you can come to my retreat even if you don't own properties I don't necessarily think the retreat is for you if you're scared and you don't think you're going to invest in the next year. Those aren't the types of people that I think the retreat attracts. Gotcha. Understood. Yeah. So, I mean, going back to what you just said, I mean, it's this shiny object syndrome and, you know, investors get it as well. I get it all the time. I'm like, what's this? What's, you know, got my head on a swivel. But, you know, it, it takes real discipline to, you know, just sit down, write out your goals and, you know, stick to them because it, it's extremely hard. And uh, that's why, you know, little people do it, but they're successful. Uh, I, I want to touch on it since you just mentioned it. And while we're here already, for someone that's just starting in real estate, how do you set up yourself to first off get achievable goals, write yourself achievable yeah. goals, but also challenging goals as well? Oh, that's a great question. I do think your goals need to scare you enough that when you look at them, you kind of go, I don't even know if I can do that. (laughs) Uh, So for mine, like, for example, I wrote on December 12th of last year of 2021, I wrote be a guest on a bigger pockets podcast. And notice that I said a bigger pockets podcast. Even me, I thought, oh, like, I don't. I don't know that I could be on the OG podcast. Yeah. And then I met the right people. And by January 12th, only 30 days later, I was being interviewed by David Green for the Bigger Pockets podcast. Yeah. For everyone that hasn't listened, please go and listen to that after this one because it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Th- thanks, Evan. I really appreciate it. And when I wrote that goal, I knew that I could do it. But I also had this like, that sounds like way out there. Like I thought it would maybe take like two years. It took 30 days. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's what I would tell people is your goal does need to scare you just a little bit. Am am I going to write like I'm going to run a triathlon? No, because like that does one, it's not in line with my goals. And I could probably like barely run a mile today. So I should probably start there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So same with investing Maybe your your first project shouldn't be some really extensive, um, the build to rent strategy, for example. Yeah. Maybe that's not the best place for you to start. But instead, it's, I want to be pre-approved in the next 14 days. Yeah. I want to have crystal clear, crystal clear deal criteria in the next 30 days. And I want to pick two to three markets in the next 20 to 30 days. 
Because those are the three pieces that an, a new investor has to have. You have to figure out how are you going to pay for this? What do you even want? And where do you want it? No, I, th- I think those are absolutely great right there. And I, I want to touch on as well, as far as, you know, you, that happened, your goal happened so fast, but it's because you wrote them down. You, you know, that's something that you were very passionate about and you knew you're going to achieve and you took action. And, you know, I, I just think that if you are, you know, success is uncomfortable. So being uncomfortable, being vulnerable and doing, you know, actionable steps that will lead you there, you'll get lucky sometimes. And, you know, not saying that you got lucky. I'm just saying that by doing and staying to your strict criteria of goals, you'll get lucky eventually. And people get lucky all the time just by doing, you know, the hard steps that a lot of people don't want to do. But um, but that's great. And you can also go ahead and check check off being on the Chasing Cashflow podcast. I know that was on there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just it kidding. was. It was. Thanks, Evan. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Dreams no. really do come true. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but let's go on. Do you have like a deal made? Maybe that we can kind of dive into. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've already given the numbers on that quad. And so the, I'll just run yeah. through those again. Yeah, um, so please. it was a four unit. So it's I'm getting rental income of 830, 850, and now 1575 and 1575. Yeah. So the details on that is I purchased it in May of 2021 for 320. 320. I put three and a half percent down and I moved into one of the four units. So you house hacked, yeah. Yeah, uh, house hacked w- that. W- was your going into it when you purchased it? W- was your goal to set it up as a two residential, just long term, and then two short term, or do you kind of pivot? No, yeah, I pivoted. Um, yeah. So I I planned on kind of taking over the Omaha market. I okay. I moved from living abroad in New Zealand to Nebraska, thinking that I would you know be on the ground door knocking doing mailers, hire cold callers. I was going to take over the Omaha market. Things didn't work out the way that I thought. So I moved into my unit, which obviously I furnished because I lived there. And then within a month, the tenants downstairs, they decided to flee in the middle of the night. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it turns out I didn't know, but I was inheriting drama. There was drama between the two tenants that both live on the bottom units. Their dogs fought. They fought. Obviously, the seller did not disclose this. And so (laughs) I didn't know, but I was walking into a lot of drama. And I think when they found out that I was the owner and now their tenant upstairs, they took it as an opportunity to just leave in the middle of the night. Okay. And this has never happened to me before. (laughs) And instead of freaking out, I thought, oh, my gosh, I have another vacant unit. I'm going to furnish it. And so I got on my hands and knees, started scrubbing, started going on Facebook Marketplace, and I furnished, cleaned and furnished and listed that unit within 11 days. Wow. Okay. And it was terrible. It was so much hard work. Like it was not fun at all. (laughs) I want to make sure that's really clear. I am sure. I am sure. So (laughs) first off, can you, can you touch on real quick for a newer investor that's going to house hack and manage themselves? How do you set, you know, clear standards as far as, you know, I want to be friendly, but this is also a landlord tenant situation. Like we're not going to be friends. Yeah. Everyone has a different, everyone has a different opinion on this. Um, I have a Google voice number that they can text, but it does not ring to my phone. I'll get notified. I'll get a text message that I have a missed call, but more or less they can't call me, which I think is important. And I kind of wait and feel things out before I say like, hi, I'm Sarah. I bought this place. So I'm not necessarily portraying myself as the landlord right away. Um, However, it always comes out like I'm not going to lie to them or or pretend that I'm other investors will do that. And that's great for them. But for me, it just didn't fit my personality or even my ethics. And so all of my tenants know that I own the building and I'm the landlord. Um, And I try to be friendly, but not too friendly. And I have learned the hard way that if you get a little too friendly and then all of a sudden they change jobs, then they're asking for discounted rent and all these things. It's just asking for trouble. Um, So one thing that I make sure that I always do, Evan, is I act with kindness. There is like enough evil in the world. I don't need to add to it. 
And so I will first act with kindness until I'm getting lied to or they try to take advantage of me. And then that's when I start to really say, hey, like I've been kind until this point. I'm also running a business. I think I think that's a you know clear you know objective there as well as treat like you said before treat it as a business it's it's not you know just an investment a hobby anything like that it is a business and you got to treat it like one and I, I totally agree I think that's amazing that you treat with you know that how you handle it and for a new investor going into it I think they should do the exact same when my wife and I we bought our four unit we did not do we went straight up oh hey we purchased this and uh, you know it was absolutely horrible so like a week later we hired a property manager and uh you know he's got it since then so but um but no i i think i think that's great and obviously you're going to cash flow more if you manage yourself and i think it just takes someone that you know i think it takes a, a confident strong-willed person to manage themselves and uh, my wife and i are not in that aspect <laughs> but uh well also to, to to tell on myself like i'm creating another job for myself yeah and now that i've scaled as quickly as i have So last year I owned three units. I owned the first single family that I talked to you about and I owned a duplex. Okay. Then I bought this fourplex. Then I bought two duplexes. So another four units. And then I bought the fourplex next door to my fourplex. So in 68 days, I went from owning three units to 15 units. Wow. Okay. And then you're obviously your case, your job workload was exponentially higher at that point. Yes. And I thought, oh, crap. (laughs) And so that's when I started looking at, okay, what can I get off my plate? And so I've ran the numbers of me hiring a virtual assistant and then training them how to be the in-between for me and all of my tenants versus property management in all. I'm in three different markets, Kansas City, Omaha and Des Moines. And so for me right now, hiring the VA makes sense. But yeah. ask me in six months how that's working, and I might pivot and get a property manager. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I 100% agree that you know just because you set a goal and, and you have a goal three months later, if you know that doesn't align with maybe something else, you can pivot. That pivoting isn't bad. It's just when you do this shiny object syndrome, and you're just like, oh, I'm gonna do this now. Oh, I'm gonna do that. I think that's when it can kind of affect you and your goals. Um, so, yeah. well, one last question about goals. So, when what, how often should a newer investor, maybe look at their goals, set their goals, look at their goals and kind of, you know, maybe pivot a little bit or adjust them. Yeah. I heard from someone much wiser than me (laughs) that he looks at his goals every day. Okay. And that at the time seemed excessive. Yeah. I do also know people that write down their goals every day and that seems even more excessive, (laughs) but here's what I can tell you that He is one of the most successful people that I know. And so at the beginning of this year, I bought like a quarterly planner and I now review my goals every day. And I can tell you I've accomplished more in the last 60 days than I've ever accomplished in business before. And so there has to be some rhyme and reason that this is working. So I do think you need to look at your goals every day. They can be one, one really great idea that I have is there is, um, you can write them out on Canva or heck even in notes on your phone and then make it the background of your phone, which I think is really cool. Um, I haven't done that, but for those that are watching on YouTube, I, I think that this sums up my 2022 goals on my phone. So it says, I don't know if I can curse on your podcast, but it says, it says, be a badass with a good ass. There you go. <laughs> there you and go. I, I saw that and that made me laugh. And and it does, <laughs> it does tie into, I want to be braver this year than I've ever been before. And I want to start prioritizing my health. And so those are my two biggest goals. And so when I saw that cheeky saying, <laughs> I said, okay, that's going to be the background of my phone. No, I told totally- you. But for you... Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I totally agree. And like, I've had a background that says nobody cares, just do it. Um, just mm-hmm. as far as, you know, starting this podcast, it, it, you know, it's a huge step outside my comfort zone. And, you know, at first I thought I was illiterate and couldn't speak, but, uh, you know, I'm get I'm getting a little bit more comfortable and now, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's a huge hurdle to go from like 
you know, support or trying to, you know, advertise my podcast to people that I know is very scary. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I love that you set something on your phone that you see every single day that reminds you, Hey, you know, just keep going. It's going to pay off. Yes. And so for your listeners, I would recommend if you've never written down your goals, it would be a lot to go from never writing down your goals to looking at your goals every day. Yeah. So so when I say look at your goals every day, those are for people that have already been in the habit of writing down their goals, maybe reviews them every once in a while. But if you've never written down your goals, start there and you just have to write them down. What I do is I write them in different categories of my life. So I have, let's see if I can do this off memory. I have <laughs> my physical goals, so my health. My financial goals, which is retirement, investments, money. I have career and work, which is separate than money. So my career and work goals have a lot more to do with impacting real estate agents, helping investors furnish their units. Like really, what is the impact of the work and career that I have? Then I have, so work, physical, finance, spiritual um, I, for me, that means something different to, than other people. It's a lot of meditation, time with my journal, growing and expanding in that way. For other people, it might be actually attending a church or whatever it is. That's your spiritual goals. And then social. I have a lot of social goals. <laughs> travel for me is also in social. Like I, of course, have crazy travel goals. <laughs> And then love and family. So for some, love and family maybe are separate. For me, they're the same, um, same goals. But all of those goals should be different. Yeah. Because what I find is that I can ask someone what's their goals and they say, oh, I want to buy four ter- short-term rentals. And I'm like, okay, like what about your family or your health? Like what about, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. And so I think it's important for people to have goals in each area of their life And then just know that life is not about balance. Balance is a myth. There's truly no such thing. And so what I try to do is I just try to crush it in all areas, knowing that some quarters are going to get more focused. Like some quarters I will focus more on one thing than than another. Exactly. And that's that's 100% fine because, you know, the next month it may be the totally opposite of the spectrum. So um, I love that you say, you know, you break it down into each individual business goals, finance, um, all that. I, I love that. And I think for a newer investor, that's that's very wise. And like you said, I think that was a huge point as well. Going from zero, writing down your goal zero to 100 like every single day, it's going to be extremely hard. So maybe just make a goal to review them weekly or and then start from there and just kind of go and, uh, you know, trans transfer into doing it every single day, but it's going to take time. But, uh, no, I absolutely love that. Okay. Going back. So you, you finally, um, I, I, I went off on a tangent there, but we went, um, you got your four unit. So the people moved out and then you just said, I'm going to furnish it now. Yes. Okay. So and, after and I f- furnished it and it went really well and I thought, Oh man, this is really fun. Oh, geez. so then when I, when I bought the building next door, I turned three of those four units into furnished rentals as well. Okay. Why, why don't you do four? Um, because yeah. I have an inherited tenant. Okay. So I, ha- when you buy a property, you have to honor the lease yeah. that the previous seller had. And so we're just slowly waiting for her yeah. to move out or, her, okay. or in this case, her lease to end. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So when you will officially make that a uh, midterm rental as well or short term. We will. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I just didn't know if you, maybe you, you like the stability of one coming in every single month just in case or, you know, how you manage that. But, but no, that's great. Um, I, I mean, we could obviously talk for a lot, much longer and I don't think we were able to scratch on some of the things I wanted to, but you, you've been absolutely amazing. And, uh, I think just as far as goal setting, as far as investing out of state, building your list of vendors and, you know, I, I just think, for a new person investing in real estate, this episode is going to be extremely valuable. Um, but let's go ahead and start working you off in uh, the, the last questions. But first off, where can people find you, uh, you know, that can connect with you and maybe get more information about your coaching business or just to connect with you with questions? Absolutely. The best place is online. So sarahdweaver.com. Um, slash freebie. I actually have it like a gift for your guests. So if they go to sarahdweaver.com forward slash freebie, there's something in there for investors and agents, two different things. 
And then if they want to reach out, I love when people reach out. And so like, I know a lot of people are like, no, I don't want any more DMs in my inbox, but it really means a lot to me knowing that something that I said on your podcast, like made a difference. And so if anyone listening, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me on Instagram. It's Sarah D Weaver. Perfect. No, I, I totally agree with that. So I'll add your Instagram and website down in the uh, show notes. So if anyone sees this, they can go ahead and scroll down and they can click on your links. Also, if, if someone can add value to you in any way, it, what could they bring to you that would be very valuable? Yeah, I would love, um, I'd love deals. So deals, yeah. I am actively, I'm actively buying um, and Gosh, I tell everyone to have crystal clear deer criteria, so I guess I should tell you mine. Right now, I am looking for a 10 to 50 unit in Des Moines or Omaha, and so I'm looking to go bigger, and if I say it out loud, then I guess I have to do it. So if anyone has a property that would make sense for some of the units to be long-term, some of the units to be medium-term, that is my next move. Perfect. And then that may force you to finally get a property manager. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, that's the other that's the other reason, Evan, is if I buy anything 10 units or above, I have to hire someone. So that is exactly why I'm going bigger. Perfect. If anyone can bring that to her, that, w- that would be great. Um, I, I also I, I want to one more question. So or well, a couple more. But this one I think could definitely help the listener. So what would you say to to, let's say, a first time, you know, investor? maybe lives in an expensive market, finally getting over a hurdle of investing out of state. If someone's like blocked, how, what, what advice would you say to them? Yeah, absolutely. I heard something amazing this weekend from someone that is incredibly wise, especially for her age. She paid about $5,000 for a program to teach her how to do creative financing. And at the time she was like $5,000, like, To some people that may seem like a lot, but I paid way more than that for my college degree. And if $5,000 means that I get to take the elevator instead of the stairs, then I'm going to do that. And I just thought, wow, like I wish more people had that mindset, like pay the experts so that you can take the elevator up. And so that would be my advice to someone living in an expensive market is pay a coach or join a mastermind of someone that's an expert in out-of-state investing and just take action and do what they say. Yeah, I 100% I agree. That's what, that's one of my goals as well. My wife and I's goal is to go, go out of state and uh, I think we're definitely going to be uh you know hiring someone to uh help us with that process just because you know they your the coach that you hire is going to make would have made all the mistakes or if not a lot of mistakes that you could be making, but they could kind of save you from those, which I think is great. Also you, I mean, you being a coach yourself probably has so many connections like you, like we were talking about before network is your net worth. Your network is probably unbelievable because of the people that you already coach, um, the, just the markets you're in and just being, you know, on the bigger pockets podcast, being just a social figure in real estate, I think that, you know, helps a ton as well. So we may be reaching out well, to you. The coolest, yeah, that's the coolest thing is that my clients, when they get off the phone with me, they're going to be introduced to a lender and an investor friendly real estate agent. And so I've had five of my one on one consultations go under contract within five days of our call. Oh my goodness. That that is incredible. That is incredible. So if yeah. you if you are listening right now and uh you know that's maybe something you want want to do or want to check into, maybe a consultation, make sure to reach out to Sarah and uh she can definitely help you with that. Um moving on to our last question. So, for someone just getting started, where would you find education right now? Yeah, content is never the issue. I mean, yeah. you can find out how to do anything online through a podcast. And so I really want to be an advocate of find an accountability partner that won't let you get into that education loop cycle. Okay. Um, someone, someone brilliant gave me the analogy. His name's Tyler. He's really big in multifamily. And he said that it's there's an equation. It's education times action equals results. And education for a lot of people is probably at like 100. You know, mm-hmm. they've read a few books. They've listened to a bunch of podcasts. But if education is at 100 and then you times it or multiply it by action and your action is zero, 
What's a hundred times zero? Zero. <laughs> zero. Yeah. So even if your education is 300, 300 times zero is zero. But what's really cool is even if your action is just one or two, like 100 times two is 200. And now you have so many more results. And so I'm pretty confident anyone listening to your podcast probably already has enough education. And the piece that they actually need help on is the action piece. Yeah. Wow. That No, that was extremely valuable right there. Well, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate you taking the time being on the podcast. And uh, I, I look forward to you crushing 2022. And maybe we can have you back out after you finally put your properties into management and you get one, a 10 to 50 unit apartment complex. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to seeing you crush it. Thank you.